Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program in which I've been given the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who because of their great love for Christ were brought home to the church. And it's Memorial Day. It's a very important day. Though I must admit it's a day that many of us do not appreciate as we should. Many of us have not experienced firsthand what Memorial Day is all about. We live in the freedom and the blessings of what others have brought to us because of their sacrifice, but we sometimes take it for granted. Sometimes our days are more filled with the trivial stresses and strains that uh, we bemoan all the time, but when they are placed alongside of the sacrifices that men and women gave for us to have these freedoms, then all these uh, menial and day-by-day -day stresses pale in comparison. And in a way, that's what Memorial Day is about, to pause, to pause, and to thank God for the blessings that we have because of His grace, but which we received through the sacrifices of men and women who fought for the freedoms that we have every day. And for this, we chose as a guest someone who will talk about his journey of faith, but a very important part of that was his own sacrifice of his, almost his life, though it was his life that he gave uh, in a difficult time in a war that, again, a war that many of us put behind us, put out of the picture, but was a difficult time in the lives that we right now share. All of us alive now remember this war, if though many of us were not there. Guy Gruters is a revert to the Catholic faith, and uh, I welcome Guy to the Journey Home program. It's great to meet you. It's my pleasure. As it's sometimes the case, someone from my own state is not all that far from me. We end up having to come all the way to Birmingham mm -hmm. to, uh, to meet. But it's great to have you here. Uh, every week what I do is I get out of the way and invite the guests to begin by letting us know where you came from spiritually. Give us a bit of your spiritual background. Okay. Right. I was really converted in prison camp. Before <laughs> that time I was just filled with pride. After a lifetime of trying to do the best I can, I was ruled by what other people wanted me to do and uh, you know my wants and desires and trying to be the best in everything I did. And Because of that, you know, through the years pride develops, not through my bragging but through success that I had. I was an Eagle Scout as an example. You, and you're brought up in the Catholic Church, right? I was brought up in the Catholic Church. Yeah. I was brought up as a Catholic and I tried to be a good Catholic and, and what that meant to me was trying to go to church, you know, and try. I gave all the appearances of being a good Catholic, but I didn't have the faith in my heart. You know, I just didn't have it. You jumped through all the hoops. But, I jumped uh, through the hoops and <laughs> that's what I really had. And But I was successful in a lot of things. I was an Eagle Scout, very good in school and ath athletics. I caused a lot of mischief in the neighborhoods because <laughs> I wasn't very obedient. You know, we would do a lot of crazy things with firecrackers and things like that. But, uh, you know, I went to the Air Force Academy, worked very hard. I was an excellent engineer. I was picked for a Rhodes Scholar candidate <laughs> from the Academy. Uh, after that, I was picked to go for a master's degree in astronautical engineering, you know, rocket, yeah. the study of rockets. Mm -hmm. And I got that degree, and I went to pilot training. I wanted to be a fighter pilot, the best fighter pilot ever. You know, again, because I'm driven by me, rather by pride, rather than by doing things for God. Uh, but I, I was a good pilot. I got a beautiful single-seat, single-engine pilot. I graduated near the top of my class in pilot training. I went to Vietnam. I was a forward air controller with the no, 173rd. Let me stop there for a second. Yeah. Um, first of all, when I, th when I think about that one pilot in that jet, that amazes me because really it's just you and this unbelievable piece of equipment, right? Yes, I mean, that's, that's right. the power that you're sitting in the midst of that machine. It takes great that's training right. and courage just to fly yeah. that. Yes, it really, it's a, it's a very worldly thing, okay, but it's like a super motorcycle, as an example, in three dimensions. And the other thing is, is you have tremendous power in the armament of the, of the thing. Uh, you know, as an example, you have four 20 millimeter cannons, and they're firing 6,000 rounds a minute. That's 100 rounds a second, and these are exploding warheads. So as an example, when you're in a fight with enemy gunners and so on, 
you know, they're, they're firing their cannon at you, but you have tremendous firepower to fire back at, at them, and you're moving at 500, 600 miles an hour as you come in on them and that yeah. kind of thing. And also as a forward air controller, you're controlling many other fighters on targets that you're marking with white phosphorus, mm -hmm. okay? There is a tremendous pride developed here, and there's a tremendous power behind a machine like that. You know, you've got 16,000 horsepower, you know, and it's just, it's, it's very, you know, you pick up a rifle and you feel powerful, okay? Well, this thing is an unbelievable <laughs> weapon system, you know? So the pride develops, you know, yeah. into a tremendous thing. And, I, uh, and that's what happened to me. I was, you know, yeah. flying around, and I volunteered for an extremely dangerous See, mission. See, that's the thing I was also going to get to. Is that you didn't have to go, right? No, no, that's right. No, every pilot is a no. Every pilot is a volunteer. Period. I mean, know? that in itself is uh, it wasn't. You were told to go, and okay, I'm going to go. I mean, you chose. Oh, I to volunteered go. for Vietnam. In fact, I volunteered for Vietnam only. You know, out of pilot training. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to be the you know the best type of thing. And again, not for God's sake, but for my sake. You know, I want to do the best I can. I had a beautiful wife, two beautiful children. You know, I had yeah. everything right and. This resulted in a tremendous pride. Then God used the shoot down. I was shot down once. I was rescued. It was a big thing. You I had was, done I, many successful missions. Many successful. That? I did four hundred missions before times. that. Many medals. All kinds of things. You what know, what the, part of the war was this at this point? This yeah. was 1967. I went over there in you know yeah. late February of 1967. And by this time now, by the time I was shot down and captured, it was December of 1967. Mm -hmm. So this was the second yeah. shoot down. Okay, so all of a sudden I go from being this pride-filled uh, person who has, has seen the winds to all of a sudden being totally humiliated uh, by men much smaller than me. You know, they beat on me bad, they tortured me, okay. I have a, a cellmate with me that they beat and tortured to death in front of me, you know. This is a terrible, unbelievable, wrenching experience to see that happen, okay. Pride has an offshoot called hatred, okay? Mm. Because of all the, the, the puncturing of my balloon or whatever you want to call it and the terrible things I saw, I had hatred, which is a total rebellion against God. You know, I'm not allowed to hate, you know. I knew that, but you know, I put that aside because I'm trying to beat these guys. You know, one way or the other, I want to beat them, okay? So I, I have all kinds of things that I do, you know, without hitting them in the mouth you know, to try to bug them and fight them and vex them and everything like that. But it's, I'm fighting a losing battle because the guards are just, you know, they rifle, hitting us around with rifle butts. I mean, they're beating yeah. the crap out of us. It's well, a losing fight. they could have killed fight. you at any time, right? Oh, sure. Uh, but I mean, you I see, by this time, so many guys were dead. You know, there was only one guy in seven that made it. So the few guys that they had left, you know, from my time frame, they were at least trying to keep us alive, you know, in most cases. But b the reason was is because they want propaganda for the anti-war movement back in the United States, okay? So they, what they really want to do is they want to torture us into giving propaganda for the anti-war movement in the United mm -hmm. States. That's their real, that's mm -hmm. the most important name they have. Did you know and that of course, you were in And we knew it, sure, because yeah. they're taking guys out, you know, and torturing them, and then they're meeting these delegations, these liberal delegations coming over from the United States. You know, these guys be tortured like crazy, you know, to do that. Now, the trouble with it is that after you've been through torture, you realize that you can probably be head. It's a total different thing than you feel when you're back here. Okay, when you're in the hands of the enemy and you've been tortured a number of times, although you may not have given in, which I never was broken, okay, but I knew I was so close that it, it could, I could be broken at any time, okay? I mean, guys would literally, you know, do what they wanted because they, it's, the pain gets so bad, okay? Hmm. So at that time in my life now, I was getting inspirations. Remember, I'm trying to fight this on my own, on my own. I'm in control. You know, Guy Gruders is going to beat these guys. I'm going to win it, okay? So the offshoot of this pride, when you get frustrated like that, is hatred, okay? When, when they beat you, you know, when you're, when you're beaten, it looks like you're really beaten, you get into this hatred, this horrible hatred. I never had hatred like this. This is mortal sin hatred. This is all day, all the time you're awake, you're thinking of how you can kill these guys, torture these guys. I mean, how can I beat them? All it is is, you know, a slavery to the sin of pride, okay? So that's where I was. And I got to the point where I was brought absolutely to my knees because I started getting inspirations to go sit in the corner and stop eating, okay? I thought I was getting inspirations from the good guys, 
<laughs> but when I got that, I realized that I was totally on the wrong track here. I had to forgive these guys, okay? So I got on my knees. I had no strength left. I really didn't. I got on my knees. I begged God. I said, God, you've got to help me. I can't handle this, obviously. I'm totally confused here. You know, I mean, if I'm getting inspirations from the bad guy to commit suicide, you know, I, I'm wrong here. I'm really wrong, okay? You've got to help me. You've got to help me. So I begged for help, and he took me all the way back. You know, moment by moment, month by month, he took me back. First of all, he gave me faith. You know, it's a gift, and he gave me the faith, and I realized that he was right there. Before that time, I didn't even think he was in prison camp because it was so evil. I thought God wouldn't get near it. You know, can you imagine that? You know, I had no faith, you know. I figured God, you know, is not everywhere. God wouldn't be here, okay? So then he showed me his presence, you know, how he reveals himself to you in the daily things of life, and what I consider miracle after miracle, he saved me from torture. He saved me from suicide. You know, he saved me from despair. He saved me from all these things, and he brought me back to where, you know, he was really the center of my life, and uh, I believe he's been the center of my life ever since, and I try to make him the center of my life, and now I know that I have no power, that all power is his, and, and it was a true, complete, over those years of his building my faith, was a real beautiful conversion to where I really believe that Oh my gosh, you know, the Catholic faith is really true. It's not just words. These things really work. They really do have the right answers. I read the Bible four times, you know, when I came back in the first year and so on. <laughs> and all these kind of things. All because he used this, this prison camp to bring me to my knees. I repented sincerely and he built me back up again, you know, from there. Hmm. You were in how long? I was in five years, three months. At what point in, the, in your time there was was this internal awakening, was it? I would say it was after, in the six month to a year time frame. Into it. Yeah. So you was still were in there for three, three and a half yeah. years, yeah, four for years. Four years, so four years of, there. Of this. Right. Um, but you see, then it was easy then, okay? Because he gave me the faith. He gave me the faith. He gave me the, the examples. He, he showed me his miracles, okay? And I, I saw his care. All right, and I knew, now I knew, by this time, I had the faith to understand that I was shot down, you know, by his allowing it, okay? That this was his game, that this was good for me, that it was great for me, that my pride had been broken, finally. You know, I saw that, I could see that, he let me see that, okay? So now, I'm, you see, now it's different. Yeah. Now it's not under my control where I'm gonna beat these guys. You see that? Mm -hmm. It's not me, <laughs> now it's him, and I'm his boy. You know, I'm just doing what he says, you see? And I'm just trying to do the best I can to be a good American POW in a communist prison camp. And I'm doing the best I can. And he's the one that's, he takes care of the torture, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And he did. And he saved me from torture. And he gave me the strength to have the joy. I had more joy in prison camp, you know, than I've ever had before or, or since in my life. Okay, he brought me real which close to crazy. Him. Yeah, which is, how can that happen? Okay, <laughs> but I had tremendous warmth and joy in my heart. You know, he'd give it to me. I'd pray all the time. You know, it was just, I was really Did close to Did you have support him. from other prisoners in this? Uh, no, no, at this time I really didn't. I was with one other guy, but he wasn't, he was a, he was a Catholic, but he was, he was uh, not really, uh, he wasn't even going to church type of thing, you know. So, um, well, did you have, no, did, was there priests or anything? Did you have No, there was that? nothing no, like that. that. So no, it was no. all flat out, you know, okay. on your knees, asking God for help, nothing. and bam, there he is. So how did your captors, did they respond to, uh, did the they captors, notice the difference? Or did they? Uh, I don't know if they did or not. Maybe over time, you know, okay. maybe over time. I think, I think they did because, um, but I mean, it was, you know, well, as an example, one of the interrogations, you know, they, it, it became obvious that I was, you know, a serious Christian, you know, mm. to the captors. As an example, one of the interrogations was a, uh, they, have a, they would have a line of interrogations every, you know, week. They'd go through a different line of interrogations. This particular line, the party line, you know, of the interrogator was, you're very lucky. You should be so thankful to our government because we have kept you alive. We give you food every day. So you should be thankful for the food that we give you food. You know, here you are a war criminal and we're giving you food, okay? Mm. And so I said, well, I thank God for my food. You know, God gives me the food, you know. The government distributes the food, but, you know, I thank God for my food. But you can tell the government, I appreciate them distributing the food, but it's God's food. So she says, no God, no God. You know, no God. There's no God, you know. 
It's all a government gives you the food. They give you everything you have, you see, and stuff like that. I say, no, they give me nothing I have. Okay, God gives me everything I have. You know, God has a soil. You know, he made the climate and the rain and the people to grow the food. Then your government takes the food from them and gives it to us, okay? But it's all God's food. You can't make a seed. Your government can't make a seed. You can't do any of that, okay? It's all God's food, okay? So he goes into his, you know, communist line, and I finally go. And I'm, the, the thing that saved me here, I believe, because I'm truly, really, really trying to help this guy. You know, I'm saying, I'm, I really am trying to convert him. I say, look, you know, despite the Politburo, which is not going to be there on Judgment Day, it's going to be a table like this, okay? It's going to be you and Jesus Christ across the table, and he's going to go through everything in your life. Like, you killed my buddy here. You tortured my friend to death, okay? That's going to be on the table. So you've got to be sorry for that. Because if you're not sorry for that, okay, then you're going to go to hell. You're going to burn forever, okay? And I, I, am, I have the zeal of the newly converted. I have real zeal. He starts yelling, okay? I start yelling. I'm in a screaming match with this guy. There's five thugs there. They take me out and they put me in a little hot box. As I leave the interrogation room, okay, the interrogator is screaming, I will show you that you will have nothing at the top of his lungs. You will have nothing, nothing, nothing without the government, nothing. Okay, so I go out to this hot box and they, it's a little hatch on the side, you crawl into it. So they open the hatch and I'm crawling into it, you know, putting a leg in to get into this thing. One of the guards picks up a stiff piece of cardboard. It's very hot. It's August, 11 o'clock in the morning, extremely hot in that thing. He picks up a piece of stiff cardboard, makes a fanning motion with it, and gives it to me. I'm just going to have nothing, right? And now I've got a fan for the hot box, okay? So I go in this thing. I kneel on my, on my it was such a clear sign. I knelt on the ground. I put the fan on the ground. I'm on my knees thanking God for not deserting me because of my pathetic attempt at evangelization. Okay, I was honestly trying to evangelize a guy, but you know, like a fighter pilot would, okay, with no, no <laughs> compassion, no nothing, just by force, you know, and so on. So it was terrible for the guy, okay? So it didn't work at all, you know, I don't believe. And so I'm thanking God for not deserting me despite obviously messing that up, you know? And so as I'm praying there with great joy in my heart, I'm sweating like crazy, great joy in my heart. I'm so happy, I'm so happy that God hasn't deserted me because he's with me so close, you know, and I can see it. And then I hear thunder in a distance, about 20, you know, minutes away, here comes a thunderstorm and cools that hot box down to almost nothing, okay? <laughs> I'm just, I'm sitting there in ecstasy. I really am, I really am. And then, you know, I get out of there, they put me in some, Stupid room put me on my knees, but that's nothing like that hot box. So at any rate, he saved me from that. And, you know, I mean, obviously, it was obvious to these guys, you know, that, that I was a serious Christian now, okay? And they gave me, you know, trouble for that. But it wasn't as, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm not telling them that I'm a Christian or anything like that. It's just that kind of thing, of you know, would, yeah. And the other thing that most of us in our day-by-day -day lives, you know, we have hope for tomorrow, mm -hmm. we presume our jobs will keep going, our families will be fine, you know, mm -hmm. I may have a mortgage, but I presume that I have a job that will pay that, you know, in other words, we have great hope for the future. I mean, what was your thinking in the midst of a month, then six months, then a year, and two years, three years, four years? Right. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, did, were you getting any news of what was happening in the war? You no, know, you weren't, except from the guys getting shot down, which was, you know, very imperfect. We had no, no news. You're in a, you're in a, what I tell people, it's like, you're in a cell, you know, you've got two, two saw horses with boards across them. That's your bed. You've got a little one quart pot of water. You get water twice a day. You get a loaf of bread twice a day. You're living on bread and water for the first years here, you know. You've got no socks. You've got a pair of pajamas and a blanket, okay. You're freezing in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. You're hot as a son of a gun, bad heat rash all over in the summertime. You know, you've got a pot for your, uh, a bucket, but it's not a big bucket for your bathroom. We had two guys in that cell, and the thing would overflow in the wintertime. So you got raw sewage in the thing. We were allowed to clean that cell out once in five years with water, okay? What? Yeah, and I mean, it's just typical communists, you know. They don't, they don't clean anything. They don't clean anything, you know. Mm. I mean, they're just horrible. Nobody owns anything, so nobody takes care of anything, okay. you know. It's just communism. It's socialism, you know, where the government owns everything, right? Yeah. So nobody does anything. 
That's what it is. But anyway, this bucket would overflow, so you've got terrible living conditions. Okay, you got no windows, no doors, mm. no books, no radio, no nothing. You know, and what it amounts to is, is that the biggest enemy to overcome is bore is boredom. You know, for those yeah. first months, because you're used to the American lifestyle, which is 18 hours a day. You know, bouncing off walls, and then <laughs> sleep for six hours. You know, then get up and start again. No time to think. No time to pray. You know, one thing after another, endless entertainment, and all of a sudden, bam. And, and I've asked in a number of the talks to say, okay, here's, if you want to know what it's like, you know, to get an inkling, what this was like, the shock this was like, the humility this was, the humiliation this was. Next Saturday, go into your bathroom. Don't take anything in there for reading or anything like that, okay? Close a door, close a window. You're not allowed to have a window or doors or anything like that. And stay there for six hours. Now, how hard is that? Stay in the bathroom for six hours, okay, without any entertainment, all right? And I've never had any, I don't think American, I don't think we have the capability of doing that. Well, we, we, we get put in that thing 24-7 in a cell, you know, yeah. for years, okay? So this was a tremendous psychological shock. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest shocks, again, with the great pride, you know, which blinds you to so many things, you know, the mm -hmm. sin blinds, right? Pride blinds you. One of the great shocks was, is that, by George, the world doesn't need me. Here I've been in this thing for, you know, six months, a year, two years. The world still exists. It doesn't need Guy Cruders. The world can get along without me. Now, we all get this, you know, as we age and we see ourselves deteriorate, you know. But I got it at 24. At 24, I realized that I wasn't anything really, okay. So this was a tremendous come down from the typical, you know, Youth, you know, the way when you're young, you know, you can change the world and boy, the world is great and you're going to you make it. So there was a big, there was a big thing of that. As far as getting out of there, it looked like we'd never get out of there. That was the hardest thing to take because they stopped the bombing in 68. The mm. bombing was the only pressure we had on them. Okay, and it wasn't until Nixon started the bombing again in late 72 that Were you able that to got hear there. when there was bombing from where you were? Yeah, sure. So we're in, in a certain sense, you knew there were people who were still trying when you could hear it, but then when you right. quit well, hearing they, it. Well, they told us, they told us, they tell us that, that the bombing had stopped in 68, that Johnson had stopped the bombing, you know, yeah. to try to win the election or something in 1968, mm -hmm. okay? So, uh, but what that meant was, is there was no pressure. I mean, they had us, they had us forever. And, and that was one of the, the, uh, the hard things to take was to say that, you know, I'm going to be up here the rest of my life, and that's fine. If God wants that, that's fine, okay? It's his game, you know? Okay. Now, uh, I volunteered for this very dangerous mission over North Vietnam. You know, I volunteered for that mission, okay? Pride blinded me to that, okay? The fact that I shouldn't, I had his wife and two children. You know, those kinds of missions, yeah. you know, probably are better left. I mean, the military is a great vocation of love. Everybody has to be a fighting man. You know, we all have to be ready to fight evil, you know, morally, you know, spiritually, physically. We all have to be ready to fight, but you don't need to go looking for trouble, okay? If, you know, if you're a bachelor, you know, if you're a bachelor officer or a bachelor fighter pilot, that's the kind of mission you should volunteer for. But the married men, I think it was wrong. I mm -hmm. think I was blinded to the fact that I shouldn't do that kind of thing. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for trouble. I'm really looking for trouble. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I made, you know, a wrong decision because of that. And, you know, the, the basic thing that I, that I was a slave to was trying to be the best. Yeah. And I let that, you know, destroy my judgment about taking on dangerous things where I had no business with the, the family I had to do that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, your question was, how was it? Was, it was unbelievable. And it was really tough. That's why it leads you to despair. It leads you to suicide. Okay. Yeah. It really is tough when you don't have God. Okay. Mm -hmm. God made it tolerable. You know, God got us through it, you know, and it wasn't just me. Everybody said the same thing. The, God got us through. The guys that made it through were the ones that turned to God for help, and he gave us the strength to, otherwise it was endless fears, when endless fears. You when know. your life was built on yourself and the pride, uh, right. and that's taken away, then there's no hope left. And there's no hope. You're on your, you're, you're yeah. only, so now you've got to commit suicide. Yeah. You're beaten. What's left? You're beaten. Was there ever the thought that you know, if I gave in to these guys, I could regain that position, that hope, but I'd be on their side. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. not that 
Yeah, that's that you a, really thought of well, that. Well, there, there was a lot. There was a lot of you know. We had 300 guys up there. Okay, and nobody gave into that temptation. I mean, that was a real temptation. I was very, very you know, looking back on, I'm very happy that American fighting men, and we're all spoiled as heck. I mean, you know, compared to the rest of the world, we are so spoiled. Okay, but we did well. We did well in that regard. You know, we fought them tooth and nail. We didn't want to give them anything. And the, you know, the, the, their temptation was, is, you know, give us something here and we'll help you out. You know, we'll make it a lot easier on you, you know. Yeah. And nobody that I was with did anything like that. And, you know, I'm talking 300 guys, maybe a couple guys did, but nobody that I ever was, you know, in a cell. Well, with. that's part of the reason that I wanted you to be our guest on Memorial Day was because just like you said, we're spoiled. As yeah, a culture, oh yeah. we're spoiled. Um, sure. And, you know, would any of us be able to withstand that pressure when, you know, on a day by day we get upset because, you know, our coffee didn't make or didn't produce our coffee the way we wanted or something. You know, that's where our lives are. Um, but in, on one hand, um, we know how hard it is for you to tell it to us because we weren't there. But yet your martyr, your witness, which is what martyr means, mm -hmm. your witness to us Part of the goal is for us to appreciate the freedoms that we have, that we are trying to help our children understand when we live every day with the ability to go outside of our bathroom. To use your example, we don't stick in a box all day long. Think of all the things we do every day that we take for granted, that are gifts that we have because of what men and women are willing to sacrifice like yourself yeah. for this. Yeah. Like this is what we want to think about today. We're going to take a break, and then we'll come back and talk more about how our faith helps us appreciate Memorial Day so that we can celebrate it in the right uh, mindset. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back on this Memorial Day. Our guest is Guy Gruters, who's, I mean, it's so hard to tell a story, uh, to share one's life in such a small amount of time, but uh, you've given us a glimpse into what you experienced uh, that most of us only, you know, experience in any way from afar uh, and trying to imagine what we would do in a similar situation. And as you've expressed so well, it's grace that enables you to get through it. There's something about your story that also just amazes me, uh, and that is that it wasn't that you were in prison with a, you know, a Bible preacher or a priest that brought you back to faith. Is mm -hmm. that you really were isolated in the midst of that? But it was God's grace that brought to life seeds that had been planted before. Talk about that, That's because right. that, sure. that in itself is amazing, and an encouragement to parents when we think about the seeds that are planted in the lives of our children. Okay. I'd been to Catholic school. Okay. One of the key teachings in the Catholic faith is, is that suicide is not right for any reason. Okay. I knew that. That had been drilled into my head. I'd never had any trouble with that. I could see that that made sense, you see. So then when it got really bad, you know, when I was brought to my knees, and the only way out seemed to me, and the inspirations in my mind seemed to me repetitively to suggest that I stop eating, go in a corner, and just forget it, you know, get back at everybody by just, you know, killing myself effectively, okay? When that happened, when those inspirations came, I remembered that teaching, you know, and that's what shocked me, really shocked me, okay? And I said, holy mackerel, I'm on the wrong side here. I'm on the side of sheer hatred here, okay? Which is the devil. You know, I'm on the wrong side here. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm really thinking wrong. Okay, I'm looking for revenge here, okay? And it's driving me to suicide. Now, that was the beginning of, that was a dramatic conversion to me, and that was a seed from my childhood. And if I hadn't been to that Catholic school, I wouldn't have understood so clearly that suicide was wrong, and that wouldn't have triggered the repentance, and it was a sincere, 
deep, total repentance, and it was a turning to God for help instead of myself, you know. So thank God for the formation of your conscience way right. back when, even right. though because of the other voices in your life that had so filled you with pride and self-centered, that, that was still there, that seed. Right. And let I me mean, talk also to those that are watching about the encouragement for them, for children or siblings that have left the church that have those seeds planted. What can they do to maybe bring well, those seeds back to fruition? Well, what happened to me was, is, is that my mother and my aunt, when I got shot down, okay, they promised God on their knees before the Blessed Sacrament to say the rosary every day till they died, okay, if he would take care of me, okay, and bring me back. And they both did that until they died, okay. And that rosary every day on the part of my mother and aunt, I'm convinced, is what was responsible for the grace of my conversion in prison camp. Okay. And believe me, my pride was hard to break, but the rosary broke it. And the rosary also up in prison camp, although I didn't know the mysteries at first, I started saying that. That was part of my prayers, although I had a lot of wonderful prayers. I had a lot of meditative prayers because yeah. I was constantly thinking, and he, he was giving me great, great thoughts, you know, on prayer and, and faith and everything. But the rosary was a key prayer. And after two and a half years up there, I was in a, a, given a cellmate who was a great farm kid from Kansas who was a great Catholic, and he gave me 30 minutes on each mystery of the rosary and let me memorize them. And then I had the mysteries you know, with the rosary. And, you know, I would say many, many rosaries every day. And again, it would be responsible for great joy and happiness, you know, in prison camp for me. You know, I think, uh, you know, I'm a, um, a, an ex-Protestant. And I know f when I looked at it from the Protestant perspective, I would not have understood the saying of the rosary mm -hmm. and the value of that and why that in itself was so important. It isn't magic. Mm -hmm. It isn't incantations. Um, but it's really reflecting on the life of Christ. It's mm -hmm. surrendering to Christ. It's recognizing the intercession of his mother, our mother, to Christ for us. And recognizing, uh, you know, asking you, know, Holy Mother God, pray for me now at the hour of my death. You know, the sinner that I am. You know, sure. That's what it's about. It's surrendering to that's that. Right. Well, another thing that happened, by the way, but the mysteries also, the mysteries yeah. were the key on that. The mysteries yeah. really kicked up that. Or the life of Christ. I mean, right, what it is. because that's what it is. It's really the life of Christ, okay? Now, later You didn't have on, a Bible to read. Didn't have a but Bible. But you had the life of Christ in the rosary. But a year before, or a year and a half before the end, before we got out, okay, they gave us a Bible on Christmas Eve. They gave it to us for 12 hours, okay? And we had made up, by this time, we had homemade pens and we used our toilet paper. It was a rough brown toilet paper. We used a toilet paper we could write on. So we had two guys on key passages of the Bible and we copied down those things, those key passages, and immediately memorized it. Now, by that time, God had really tremendously built up my faith and I could see that this Bible, you know, these key passages were describing exactly the way life really worked, okay? So... I was, I had another beautiful thing I came out of there with is, is that one of the key, key, key props of the Catholic faith, you know, yeah. you got the Bible and you got tradition, okay? One of the key props was exactly true. So I read the Bible four times in that first year I was back from <laughs> cover to cover with great attention, okay? And that started, you know, a lifelong, since then, you know, 30 years, a lifelong Bible study and, you know, study of many, many other spiritual readings because of that. We know. have an email that uh, kind of tags right onto what you're saying. This comes from James in Washington. He says, Guy Gruders, how did your life change when you came back to the United States after what you had gone through and seen in Vietnam? Well, uh, the main thing was, is God was the center of my life. I didn't put anything else above that. And I realized that uh, my children now were seven and eight years old. They'd never seen their father. Okay, I was over there six years, you know. So I felt I owed it to them to have a good family life and, and to concentrate on the family life. You know, so mm -hmm. that's what I did. I left the service. I got into the airlines. I was an airline pilot, you know. I started a software business with my brother, you know, which mm -hmm. still exists today. And uh, basically, I tried to have a good family life. Now, we had five children since then. So we've got seven children, okay. My wife is a great saint, okay. <laughs> and uh, just a real sweetheart in every way. And... We've, we've had a chance to raise some children for God, you know, which is great. And uh, I, don't, I don't worry about great accomplishments or anything like that anymore, okay? I just worry about what the, bio, what the Catholic Church says is trying to do what I'm supposed to do, you know, as best I can every day, you know, with prayer. You know, trying honestly to turn everything over to God. That's what I really try to do. A, when I think about your kids not having seen you for six years and your wife 
not having seen you for right. six years or communicated with you. But she found a different man when you came home. Yes, oh yeah. And it was extremely tough on all the, all the women, you know, of all yeah. the POWs, okay? We were totally different. Number one, we hadn't had any sun for six years, okay? Now, you know, uh -huh. the lack of vitamin D, the lack of sun is responsible for the depression of the northerners in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. That's why they love to go south, okay? <laughs> but we had no vitamin D, you know, for six years. And vitamin D has a lot of effects they're finding out, okay? So we were in a terrible depression you know, for those years, okay? Wow. The last couple of years, they st the last couple of years, they stopped the torture, the bad torture on a regular basis, okay? And I saw a mental recovery of my fellow POWs in those last two years, it was unbelievable. But when we got out, we were still hmm. weird, okay? We were still, no doubt, mentally affected. And they told my wife that it would take us as many years to recover psychologically as we were up there and there would be some things that we would never recover from mm -hmm. and you know that really is true that kind of situation is a really wicked situation and uh, you know getting through all those things getting my wife through them getting me through them getting through the relearning of each other and really a different person okay was all you know because of God and because of you know church and communion this time attended with real attention Instead that's what I was going to ask about that because I know uh, when you came out of that camp and you came home, uh, you, you had a lot of healing to do. But I was also thinking, do you remember back to the first time you were able to enter into the Catholic Church and now you're experiencing it in a way that you never appreciated before? Right. I mean, do you oh, remember yeah. some of your thoughts? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was so happy that I had the faith and the Catholic Church. And I, you know, was very comfortable. And I mean, I was extremely comfortable with the Catholic Church having the right answers. I have no problem with the authority of the Pope and the Magisterium, you know. I am so happy for that, okay, because otherwise it's an endless, what is, I wonder if this is right, I wonder if that's right, and so on. And it makes all kinds of sense to me. And, you know, the spiritual writings of the saints are just a great gift. And all you have to do is read the books of the saints, and it's a wonderful comfort in life, you know, just really a wonderful comfort. There might be young men who are watching uh, in their teens, mm -hmm. um, and they're wondering about the service. Mm -hmm. Talk about them, words to them, because okay, well, uh, I think you know, I, it's a difficult choice. Sure. Well, what I believe is, is that the father of every family has to be a great fighting man to be a good God-fearing man, okay? He has to be willing to fight evil spiritually, mentally, he's got to be for the truth, okay? Spiritually, obviously, he's got to be, you know, for the Ten Commandments and forgiveness and love God and neighbor, real charity. You know, he's got to do that. He's got to be that. He's got to train his children in doing that. He's got to fight mentally. He can't allow lies to, to take hold in his family. And he, physically, he's got to provide physical security. He's got to put his life on the line if anybody comes in that house. He's got to do that, okay? So, he's got to be a fighting man. Now, there is a right and a responsibility for collective defense of the community and of the country. Out of the fighting men who should be the father of every family, okay, comes your fighting men of your police, your fire, your military, okay, and they have a duty to provide collective defense, okay. It's a great vocation of love because your physical life is on the line every day. There's no greater love than having your life on the line, okay. So when people look at the military, what they really should look at is it's a vocation of real, true love according to Jesus Christ. That's the way I look at that. And I think a beautiful time to do it is right after high school or right after college, you know, before you're married, especially if you can do it that way. But even if you're married, you know, there's tremendous, uh, you know, most of the military is, you know, you're not going to, there's, you're, you're not going to be in the high risk missions like the behind the line halo missions and so on. You're not like that in a normal service. Okay. So, you know, there's a, all kinds of place for uh, oh, many, of, most of my friends. Depends on what your gifts are sure. when you get in. Yeah. Right, right. And depends on where you are and so on. But yeah. I mean, there's a real place for a family life in the military for a career and everything like that. The military, to me, is a great, wonderful way to spend life on earth. And because it's such a sacrifice, you know, God rewards you by having tremendous men and women around you your whole life. Hmm. Because the military crowd is one of the greatest crowds. I can't imagine a better crowd of people than the military crowd. You know? I remember the, the old classic movie, uh, Sergeant York with Gary Cooper. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. certainly it, it gave it a, a different look of war than what really happens over there. We know it was a bit glamorized, but here he was, a, 
a, a, a, you know, a very religious young man from, I think, Tennessee, uh, conscientious objector because he, mm -hmm. he was struggling with, does a Christian fight? And that right. was the, the issue. And, but the way the movie portrays it is that when he's over there, he gets inspired to recognize that by fighting, you save lives. Right. By fighting, you're saving lives because you're fighting against evil. Of course, then, of course, the movie glamorizes him capturing, you know, a couple hundred Germans. Right. But in the end, it was because he saw that was the only way to save lives. That's right. Well, it's the only, the other thing is, is that otherwise, you know, the Catholic teaching is, is that otherwise evil has no bounds. Otherwise evil, uh, you know, Hitler has no bounds. Okay. Stalin has no bounds. Hussein has no bounds. Okay. You know, you yeah. can't do it. You yeah. can't let people come into your house and attack your wife and kids. You can't be walking by somebody that's attacked by a gang and not fight. Now, when you go after 20 guys that are beating up on somebody, okay, that's a bad situation. It doesn't matter. There's only one thing to do if you're not a coward, and that's stop those guys beating up on that person, okay? And that's what the police, the fire, and the military does. It's really what they do. You know, a well-intentioned soldier is a great, you know, Christian. And sometimes, you know, we, we take our freedoms for granted, and, and when the battle, the threat is way over there, mm -hmm. well, that's their, that's their problem. And right. it took a while in both of the major wars for us on this side of the ocean to realize, right. no, that's our problem. Right. Not just because it's over there, it's our problem too, which is also why you volunteer to go way over there because we recognize that was our problem, and we're, that's right. we're dealing with that even we're as we speak. We're doing the same thing today. That's right. Even as I say, it's not just a, yeah. a, a, that problem over there. And we knew it when it touched our soil back in 9-11. Right. And mm -hmm. so we know the reality of that. I mean, these are the issues that we need to reflect on on Memorial Day. And we do have an email which expresses some thoughts that I wanted to ask you from Sarah in Florida. She writes, what do you think we can do on Memorial Day and every day to support our troops now fighting for us in different countries, for example? What can we do? Well, I think number one is to have a very positive attitude toward the military and toward the servicemen, okay? To pray, I mean, praying should be a part of everybody's life every day. And, you know, when we, when we have our general prayers, yeah. you know, part of that should be the men fighting to uh, limit yeah. the attacks, you know, in, in the, in the, they're, they're fighting in 50 countries. Our, our special ops forces are fighting in 50 countries of the world right now. We're chasing them all over the world. We've got an active defense here. It's really a beautiful, you know, yeah. proactive defense. So, I mean, these guys are in terrible danger in many cases, and we should be praying for them that, number one, they are successful, and if they're not successful and they die, they go to heaven and, and things like that. So, yeah. I mean, to me, prayer is always the right answer when you're not in, yeah. the, in the fight itself. And I know? wish there was a way that we could get the message out that it's, it's one thing to have different opinions about what we're doing over there or whether we should or shouldn't. That's one thing. But when we have men and women over there, then in the public sector, we shouldn't be dis debating these issues. That's right. what really bothers yeah, I, me. I believe that as soon as, as, soon as our, you know, when we, when we legally commit our troops to combat, okay, like the president with the Congress, like we've done, okay, yeah. then that's the end of public debate, yeah. okay? And I don't believe we ought to tear down our troops or the effort, because I think that only means that the terrorist will eventually win. Well, your own witness you know. of yeah. why were they trying to turn you in the camp because they were using you right. for the anti-war. Well, the big thing that they'd tell us in interrogation after interrogation, because they'd say, you know, they'd say, well, we're going to win this war and so on. We'd say, you're never going to win this war. You know, you're never going to win it because we were beating them everywhere we fought them. OK, they said, no, we know we can't win it militarily, but we can win it in the United States. That's how we beat France. And that's how we will beat the United States. We will beat the United States in the United States. Okay? And they were right. And you can see them doing the same thing now in this Iraq thing. Okay? And the fact is, is that the only disgrace of Vietnam was losing it, quitting the fight. That's the only disgrace there is. The disgrace was not being there. Probably the best fight we ever fought. The disgrace was quitting. And we quit because of exactly what you say, giving aid and comfort to the enemy publicly. Yeah. It shouldn't happen. You've got it's guys over there now. dying, you it's know. It's happening right now, Yeah, sadly. And we need to be praying for that. We need to pray for our leaders to be using their heads mm -hmm. in right. the discussion, debate of this in the public sector. I've um, got an email from John, uh, Texas, writing, uh, Mr. Gruders, how was your wife's faith affected by your experience as a POW? My wife was, uh, you know, 
uh, my wife was a, a, a she was a con convert from Episcopalian. Okay, she was a better Catholic. You know, she was a better Christian before I was shot down than I was. All right, uh, she became a Catholic. You know, years after I was shot down. I think she says because I, I was so strong in my faith and she studied it, she became a convert without me even knowing about it. She surprised me one Easter, okay? But my wife, I always, you know, in my, uh, in my feeling, is a sweetheart with a heart that's 20,000 times better than mine. There's no way I could ever have her heart. Uh, today, Memorial Day, there's parades everywhere. I remember them when I was a little kid. I was a Boy Scout walking in the parades or in the band. Or, right. And we'd see the old cadres up there trying to fit into their uniforms. Uh, I, don't under, I didn't understand what was going on. You know, we were walking in the right. parades. We were having a good old time playing tag amongst the tombstones. Just didn't get it. Talk to us about how we ought to understand and celebrate Memorial Day. Right. Well, I think, you know, I think these are wonderful things. Uh, I really do. I believe they're wonderful things. I think uh, the, 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 it's, a, it's a day of appreciation. To me, it's a party for our freedoms. To me, it's like, you know, really July 4th, and we have a chance to interact with, generally they have soldiers talking to these things and so on, and it's a chance to uh, publicly demonstrate our appreciation for it and listen to what they're saying. Generally, they're trying to pass on the lessons that they, they feel like they learned. And you it's know. a time of thanking them. Uh, sure. And yeah. when you thank any one of those, who are still alive, you're also thanking thousands of others that mm -hmm. they represent from right. their units that are on their uniforms right. that they fought beside. You and I were talking earlier about, you know, my father was a, was a CB, uh, Guadalcanal, uh, and of course now he's with the Lord, um, but he didn't talk much about it. Mm -hmm. And there may be many men who are, men and women who are at these Memorial Day celebrations that they're not really talking a lot about what happened. They're wearing the uniform, they're, they're, but there's probably a lot going on in their heads that they just can't talk about. Why don't they talk more about it? Well, I think uh, one thing that happens is, is that, first of all, I'd like to just to say, everybody that wears a uniform, everybody that's been in the military is equal, okay? You don't have some guys that are heroes and others that aren't. Everybody's, you know, as soon as, yeah. they're, as, soon as they put the uniform on, they're under military discipline. So you never want to, to me, discriminate between yeah. veteran service okay to me it's all there because you can be sent anywhere you are in a nuclear war everybody you know on a built basis is going to lose their lives okay everybody is in the game when you put your certain thing same way with police and firemen they're always on the line okay so so i just want to say that as an aside now on the other thing as far as talking about it, the experience of war is totally different from the movies totally different from, as a matter of fact the experience of war is totally different i really believe for everybody that's been in it you know, except that maybe within the same unit, but even then there's tremendous differences from foxhole to foxhole. You know, one guy has his buddy killed, the other guy doesn't. I mean, there's tremendous differences here. War looks to a young man too many times like it's glorious or this kind of thing. Okay, there's nothing glorious about it. It's a, it's a last ditch defense of society. That's what it is. It ought to be understood as a realistic, real pain in the neck you know, really tough son of a gun thing and nothing that you can ever figure you're going to win, okay? It's really a fight, you know, including in Iraq. You never know if you're going to win it. You've got to fight like the devil and not quit, you know, to try to, to try to do that. But I think people just get discouraged because they talk about it and there's no real understanding it like anything in life. You know, if you haven't done it, it's tough to understand it, you know? One of my favorite lines from one of my favorite mu musical songs uh, the Dream, the Impossible Dream, from mm -hmm. uh, The Man of La Mancha. Yeah. One of my favorite lines in that, when he's talking about the great quest, is to march into hell mm -hmm. for a heavenly cause. Yeah, that's right. To march into hell for, for a heavenly, heavenly cause. cause. Right. I mean, the thought of that commitment to Jesus Christ and defending no matter where you must go. Right. I mean, that's what you're, we're called. Every one of us is called to do that. That's right. Some, it, it, many of us are not called to put our lives on the line as you did or to experience it. But on our day-by-day -day basis, still, whether it's at work or in our neighborhood, with our children, mm -hmm. that we fight, as you said, we're fighting against evil. That's right. And we need to right. be willing to march into hell right. for that heavenly cause. Right. And, a, and, a, and the toughest fight is on a spiritual level. 
okay? You know, the fight against abortion, the sin of the society. This is how you avoid war. You knock out abortion, homosexuality, pornography, divorce. You knock these things out. And the way you knock them out is by fighting them on a daily yeah. basis. It's not even a physical fight here. You know, but this is a way to really make sure you don't ever get into the really big wars yeah. is to get the sin out of the society, you know. And sadly, uh, you know, uh, that some of the same ideologies that you were fighting over there yeah. are here in our yeah. institutions, in yeah. our schools. That's in true. Our, and we got a lot of yeah. battles that we need to fight here at home. That's right. We do have another email from Jason in Montgomery. Uh, Guy, how were you released from the POW camp? Also, have you had an opportunity to contact any of the captors since the war? Um, the, t as, as far as the captors concerned, no. Okay, I haven't looked to yes. do that or done that. Okay, I have no, I have, t you know, total, I, I try to have, I, I'm not interested in being judged by God on Judgment Day <laughs> because I have, you know, grudges. So I have no grudges against any of them, but I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, looking for going back there or anything like that. Uh, as far as the other thing was concerned, the other question was... How are you released? Okay, how is it released? The Nixon, in 1972, late 72, started a bombing in North Vietnam, a heavy bombing attack on North Vietnam, which got them to the peace table in early January and, part, and signed a peace agreement which, where we had won Vietnam, okay, where South Vietnam was free, and all the POWs were to be released. And we were released in the next few months. And then, you know, uh, we came home. They actually flew Air Force C-141 transports into Hanoi Airport, and we were bused there from the prison camp and put on the, uh, you know, turned over to U.S. How did you uh, find that out? They, I'm just curious. As part when of you the peace agreement. I mean, well, was, uh, on a given day, all of a sudden, someone yeah. opened the door and. Well, you. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what. What really was funny was is that we were in at this time we were in dungeons, real j dungeons in jungles up on the Chinese border, way up in the mountains in the in the Himalayan foothills up there. Okay, in North Vietnam, way up by the border, and uh, they told us that we were never going to leave, leave that camp unless the war was over, when we were brought up there eight months before or whatever, okay? Now, this particular night, uh, so we were, the, the trucks, the, a supply truck would come up about once every month with food, you know, for the, there was about uh, 200 or maybe 150 POWs up in that camp, okay? So, a, a long, way far in the distance, you could hear a truck winding up a mountain road, you know how you hear the gears wind out? Okay, so he would wind out, you know, and you heard a truck coming in, so the truck came in. Now, we hit a guy up on the uh, shoulders of another guy, you know, and we, we'd watch like that. We hit a vent. There was no windows or anything, but there was a vent up about 10 feet. So we'd watch, we'd always be watching that camp. This is at night now. And uh, then about 20, 30 minutes after that, now one truck, that's fine. You know, everybody knows that's nothing, okay? But then we heard... Far in the distance, we heard another truck engine winding out, okay? Which means there's more than one truck, which means we're probably being moved, which means that war is probably over, okay? <laughs> so we all just lay, lay there and listened because we didn't dare believe it, you know? And as the time went on, finally there was no doubt it was another engine. And so one of the guys said, holy jeez, that's another truck, okay? So we were there and we watched another truck come in. And that night we watched about... Uh, 10 or so trucks come in. They put about 19 guys in a truck for the move, you know. So we watched 10 trucks come in and pull up off. The first truck pulled up off the park. There's a little parking area in the middle of these dungeons, you know, cleared in the jungle. And he pulled up off that. So that's why we listened for that second one. When the second one came, then 10 other, you know, about 10 trucks altogether came in there. The next morning, first thing, we're put on these trucks, about 19 guys to a truck. You know, you're blindfolded. You put in your irons and, you know, all that kind of stuff. As you start traveling, the roads are terrible. You're you're, th you're throwing up over each other, you know, you're just in horrible shape, okay? So after, and it was a 24-hour trip back to Hanoi. After six hours at the stop, you know, our commanding officer said to the North Vietnamese convoy commander, you know, he said, we need some relief here. These guys have got to get, you know, a little bit of cleaned up here. They're full of filth, you know, stuff like that. He says, that's no problem. You're going to be home soon anyway. So that went like, you know, the commander passed that down. Like, so that's the first time we knew that something was happening. Then when we got down to our, what we called a go-home camp, in the go-home camp, by, by treaty with the United States, they had to read the treaty, which said that we were going to be leaving uh, our particular group of shoot-downs. They released us in shoot-down order. We were in the third shoot-down. You were going to be released on March, you know, 13th from the Hanoi airport, okay? Wow. So, and wow. then for the next couple of months, you know, we had, we were in this thing. We didn't believe it, but we really, it looked like we were going home. How about a, just a final word of encouragement to any 
who might be watching who have uh, sons, daughters, siblings serving right now. Okay. Maybe a word of encouragement. Uh, I would say again that the best thing in the world is daily mass, uh, daily mass and communion and the rosary and uh, trying to uh, give your children the freedom to come back on their own. In other words, no force. I think once the kid is, you know, 16, 17, 18, you're in a persuasion mode only here. And without trying to force them in any way, trust God for that conversion. Guy, thank you for your courage you're and welcome. your sacrifice and your you're witness welcome. to us. And God bless you and what you continue to do in your life to serve our Lord Jesus and his church. Thank you, thank you for joining us on Journey Home. Let's celebrate this day in the way it's supposed to be celebrated and to be thankful to God for the way he's shared so much with us and usually through the lives of others as we experience his love and his protection and the gift of his grace. God bless you. See you next time.